Oh, and then I get arrested after I get, um, so I go on the airplane. I'm really bad at my job, terrible at it. I'm like shaking. There's like a kilogram of coke here, a kilogram of coke here. I'm like waddling through the airport. Hi, everyone. Thanks for um, having me. I'm Emily. I'm from Hamilton, Ontario. And before you puke on the floor in front of you, it's actually a really great spot to live. <laughs> yeah. I was raised there, really good home, really good family. Um, I also had a bowl cut. Um, oh yeah, this is my talk, it's called Love Lockdown. It's a little hint. This is me. Um, bowl cut, very rebellious, as always. Um, didn't like conforming to the status quo, so that's me growing up. And I grew up in a household just full of love. Middle child of, of three daughters, Scorpio middle child, so I don't know, you can, Think whatever you want, but yeah, I usually get. <laughs> this is me after I graduated university. Very clueless. <laughs> Drink in hand. Um, I took a nice five years at the University of Guelph. Graduated with honors. Um, my degree was in international development, and that was because when I was 18, I took a trip to Costa Rica. I was like, oh, I want to help save the world and save turtles and do all these wonderful things. And university was great. Um, I got kicked out of residence for starting a food fight, banned for life, had to pay $1,000 in fines. Um, but it's okay, because I graduated with honors. Anyway, so I was ready for the, wor the real world, as you can clearly tell. <laughs> so I was, yeah, five years. And then with my degree, I had to travel, like do an internship, because I wanted to get international experience. So I decided I want to go to Indonesia, and I applied for this internship with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And before, like you say, that sounds really fancy, like no one else applied. So it was really easy to get the job because it was like on the other side of the planet. This is me, ready for Indonesia. Ready, ready for it all. It's actually at a Skrillex concert, but you get what I mean. This is me in Indonesia in Bali, working very, very hard. Got a nice four drinks beside me. You know, they had a very lax work schedule there, so I think that's a pack of cigarettes in there. I'm not sure, but cigarettes were really cheap there. They're like a dollar a pack, so why not? This is me doing real work, um, exploring, the, exploring the community, exploring the culture. I, I actually worked with, um, yeah, so I worked with a nonprofit, and I worked with um, vic like people that had HIV and AIDS, and pretty much took what I learned from my degree in Guelph, and helped apply that, that knowledge to there. And so I was there for about 12 weeks the first time I loved it. And it really helped me like, see the person I want to be back home. Because like, there they have so much less than what we do here and they're so grateful. And I was like, I want to cultivate that energy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it home. And so I came home and decided to move back to my parents' house and then move to Toronto because I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I was like, hey, well, this is actually after my first corporate job and it was selling postage meters. Yeah for a company called Pitney Bowes, and I didn't know what Pitney Bowes was until I walked through the door. And yeah, but I did really well at selling machines that were pretty much obsolete, so I figured maybe I can start my own company doing social media, because I'd, I'd built up quite a following from all my traveling, and that's me eating um, rice for lunch. And this is right in Liberty Village, so I moved into Liberty Village, starting a social media company, seeing how it was going. I was basically doing it for free to build up um, my clientele, and it, it went really well. And my parents were like, why don't you settle down? Why don't you, you know, meet a nice guy? Because I was just all over the place. I was not really ready for anything at that, that time. So, start my social media business. Here we go, Toronto, 2013. And this is fast success. I got to work with like Daryl Sittler. Um, I did a golf tournament for him, so I would do photos and videos. That's Tiger Williams, hilarious. This is me um, doing an Instagram campaign for Tim Hortons on camp day. So that was great. Um, this is also, I got invited to the Hockey Hall of Fame for that event, so that was a good time too, wore glasses. <laughs> then I started dating for all the wrong reasons. I, I met a guy named Tim, super nice. I thought, you know, I was ready to settle down. My parents wanted me to settle down. Super nice guy. He, he like, tr brought me, like, all around the world with him. My parents were super happy. I just didn't tell, tell them that he was, like, 30 years older than me. So when I said I was going out with an old friend, they thought I just met someone from the past. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> super nice guy, but I just wasn't ready to get married yet. Anyway, 
So this is me at the airport preparing for a flight to go see Tim, and I would just consistently get drunk at airports because, I don't know, nothing else to do at the airport. Temporary escapes. So when I, came, when I come, back, come back to Toronto after these trips with him, and, and my partner Tim would help me build my business, and so I'd come back and just kind of not really be happy. So I'd find these temporary escapes in Trinity Bell Woods Park. <laughs> you can tell what's in the bottle there. You, <laughs> the shirt's kind of ironic. <laughs> And then this is when things got really bad. Um, my parents actually split up after 30 years. And I knew like I grew up with like pretty much anything I could ask for. And so when you see people that you love split up, it doesn't matter how old you are. You can be 10, 25, 45. It's still really freaking hard. And so many people challenge me on that. They're like, well, you were old enough. And I'm like, OK, you go through it then. You tell me. All right? And it was really hard because it's people you love and they don't want to hurt anyone. And of course, I was already drinking and abusing drugs at the time. So I just kind of made it a whole lot worse. I went from celebrating to medicating. And this is a picture I took when they were on a hike together, trying to like fix their relationship, but I knew it was like over. And so I actually captured that. And I was like, it's really good photo. And then this is me in the bathtub trying to cope with now the family separation. I don't, my, my, my parents don't even really hear from me. They only hear about the time I showed up to my grandma's house, like completely wasted and couldn't form a sentence. So that wasn't good. And then I meet Mr. Wonderful. This guy is just fantastic. We do business together with my social media, pays me on time for the first little while, helps me move. This is actually the first time I've shown this picture. So I'm, um, and you know, he, he like doesn't want me to commit to anything. He doesn't pressure me to do anything. He's like, just genuinely nice. He's not like a perv. It's great. Love it. <laughs> Hit it off right away. But he knows exactly what's going on with my family. And so we kind of are seeing each other for about six months. And then he comes over one day and he's like, Emily, like, I got to ask you something. And I'm like, what? He's like, I, w I really want to take you on this vacation. You know, you know, you've been going through so much shit, but there's just something I got to ask you. And I was like, well, what is it? Well, I just have to bring drugs back. And I was like, get the fuck out of here. Absolutely not. Motherfucker. I'm going out to the bar that night. He asked me again. He's like, okay, forget I ever said anything. He's like, let's just go on this trip. We're going to go. We're going to have so much fun. I'm like 30 drinks in. So I'm like, okay, sounds like a good idea. Send him my passport information that night. That passport information goes to some drug cartels in St. Lucia. I find out later. So da da da, going to the airport. It's fun the first three days. They're great. This is me actually having fun on the beach. Three days in, he tells me, all right, it's time to go to work now. Did you really think it was all fun and games? I'm like, yeah. We... <laughs> Shit. <laughs> anyway, um, so I'm mad. I'm sad. I'm upset. I'm embarrassed. I'm like everything. But I also still trust him. When you get to know people for six to eight months, and they've never been weird, and they've been nice, and they've just because someone's not punching you in the face doesn't mean they're not like manipulating you and, and abusing you, right? So. I was like, okay, like, I don't know, I guess I trust you, but I also just want to go the fuck home at this point. I don't know, I guess he thought because my degree was in international development, I could maybe smuggle drugs under that <laughs> degree. <laughs> Absolutely not. This is a sta completely staged photo. This is after I found out that I had to bring drugs back with me on the plane because he had a debt. And I knew that I was in a lot of shit, but like, you can see it in my eyes that I'm just like, something's clearly wrong, and I'm just like, Pretty much black out the rest of the trip. Oh, and then I get arrested after I get, um, so I go on the airplane. I, I'm really bad at my job, terrible at it. I'm like shaking. There's like a kilogram of coke here, a kilogram of coke here. I'm like waddling through the airport, right? And so they're obviously like, what the fuck's going on with this girl? Like something, something's clearly wrong. Get arrested, put on house arrest. My parents had to come get me from the jail that weekend. My mom, you know, doing white people things, had to come back from the cottage. Um, like, she's like, oh my God, $50,000 bail. Um, I'm sitting there, I'm like, oh, I'm so embarrassed. I'm in shackles, like hands, legs, shackles. And now I have to go live with my mom. And I'm still very confused. So how's my time? I'm good? Okay. <laughs> so yeah, I didn't have to wear an ankle bracelet, but this is my first day of house arrest. And I had to had, have signed notes for like everywhere I went. Like, Emily is going to go to the library today. And so my mom would sign it. And you're telling a 26-year-old she's got to have handwritten notes? I don't think so. So I was really, really mad. 
I was just pissed off at everyone. My parents were questioning everything that I'd done in the past, totally like not believing that I'd actually traveled for good. And so I actually separated myself from them for a bit and I was just mad. Like I'd, I just like spiraled, but I still managed to keep my business together somehow. I didn't tell anyone because I, my lawyer told me not to and B because I was like super embarrassed and I still didn't really know what was going to happen. I thought it was just going to go away. Like maybe I could scrub some graffiti off a wall or pay a fine. Like it doesn't work like that. But when you're not used to the justice system, you really have no clue. And that's why I, I, <laughs> I realized later that I was targeted because I was so ignorant to how everything worked. And then this is me in denial of everything, surrounding myself with people who told me that it was all his fault and that I had nothing to do with it and that, you know, he should, we should go kick his ass. And I was like, yeah, 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 that's a great idea. Don't ever do that. <laughs> I, I didn't, but, you know. <laughs> Eventually I found out I was going to have to go to prison. <laughs> yeah. I was like, okay, I watched border security. Why did this happen to me? Like... Thought I knew everything. <laughs> I didn't know everything. And, but over this two and a half years, and that's how long it took to kind of go through the court system, drain my bank account and legal fees, um, I realized that I wasn't moving anywhere until I could take responsibility, take responsibility for my role. Sure, maybe I didn't orchestrate this drug smuggling operation, but I could have asked for help when I needed it, but I didn't want to, because I was a female running a business. Mm -mm, I didn't want to seem weak. I didn't want my parents to see me in pain. And I thought that the, the alcohol and drugs were helping me get through, but it wasn't. Like, cocaine is like Botox for the soul. Like, you just freeze. You don't move, right? You don't go back, forward. Like, it's, and that's what I was doing. I was doing cocaine like three to four days a week and alcohol too. And I, I didn't see anything wrong with it. I thought I was just, just coping. It became normal to me. So I, after two and a half years, surrendered. I was like, okay, taking a guilty plea four years, something called mandatory minimum, which is new, also news to me. But I knew that I could use this time to like improve my life and do something, because I, I knew that it couldn't have just happened to me. And I knew that of all people, I could find some sort of inspiration in there to build something, to build something, use my creativity for good instead of using my creativity for bad, like thinking of how I'm gonna get people back. And that's the thing, when you're an entrepreneur, you can be like, really, really bad in a creative way. We can get out of things or do like malicious things, but we can also do really, really powerful, powerful, positive things. And that's what I decided to do when I was sentenced to four years in prison. So this was my Instagram post, quiet surrender. I wasn't ready to share it. I didn't want a narrative to be constructed about me when I was away, but I knew that I would talk about it after. So that was it, out of office. See you later. That's me, inmate. 410-917-F. Um, I was sentenced to Grand Valley Prison in Kitchener, and that's a federal prison. So I got to live in a house with people that had committed all sorts of offenses. And before I got to prison, I was terrified. I was like, I don't want to live with those people. And then when I got there, I realized that we're all just the same. And we all just made emotionally charged decisions that got us there. And of all people in there, I was, in fact, the most lucky because the majority of people in prison don't have the family, they don't have the resources, they came from terribly traumatic situations and I had none of that and I, I was like, I wanna do something, I wanna create something. And so one day we were popping popcorn and putting our own little red, like spices on it and one of the girls put like lemon, pepper and dill on it because we had like access to some spices and then I was like, holy shit, this is like so good because in prison like you wanna try to eat healthy because there's like no exercise, limited access to, to like mental health services all that stuff. And then I was like, maybe I can create like a social enterprise where I can employ people that have maybe been to prison or looking for like a job when they get out or a way to share their story. Cause like I know I wanted to share mine. And I knew that a lot of, like every person there wanted to share theirs too and just have a second chance or a first chance for a lot of people. So that's when Cons, the Cons and Kernels was born. I took a survey of all the inmates. I was like, what should we name it, guys? Made it a very collective thing. And so that was the original name. I had the logo designed, like me and my business partner, through snail mail. So we'd like sketch designs back and forth. I started building like a prison Rolodex of like names and contacts of people from like magazines, newspapers, wrote letters, um, got like 
really good mentors like Dave Chilton. I wrote David Chilton the letter because he lived in Kitchener, and I was like, your book's awesome. And so he's like my coach now, which is cool. And I would keep all my PR notes in these little memo booklets. And so I still have them now. So all the plans that I wanted to, to do when I got out. And this is me on my release day after almost 11 months. So it's public speaking doesn't make me nervous anymore because I've already been like interrogated. I've been in front of parole boards, everything. So it's OK. Dragon's Den, I went on that too. So yeah, I was ready for a reentry. I was ready to do this thing. And nothing was going to stop me. And I knew that also my commitment to sobriety was going to help. My commitment to sobriety was going to help this skyrocket. Been sober for two years, guys, by the way. <laughs> I know. I feel great. And I started with one pot in my mom's house. And pretty soon that escalated. My mom's house was like full of popcorn. <laughs> it was great. It was a little whirly pop. Now, um, I was ready to launch, so I contacted the local newspaper. I was like, hey, I'm Emily, this is my story. And I shared it the way I wanted to share it and why I wanted to do what I wanted to do. And so I make it now in a store in Hamilton. I basically started going to as many events as I could. I would go to like AA events or NA events or just anywhere where I could give out the popcorn, literally, because popcorn's like really cheap to make. So you can, or it's relatively cheap at least. And then, yeah, just go and talk about my story and what I want to do. Acceptance is me and JT, John Tory. I did a pop-up here in Toronto in October. Um, so the CTV came and covered it. Um, that's them. So it's just crazy what you can kind of do when you really put your mind to it. And like I did it. Like I worked, I work every day, but I love it. It's not really work. And of course I like face some backlash, but like whatever. I don't care. <laughs> Bye. And this is something I like to call emotional profit. It's when you do work that you love that's actually good for other people. So growth and meaning equals emotional profit, and that's money for the soul. And that's what truly motivates me. And then, yeah, I might not own a property, but at least I can own this, and that is my most valuable asset. So thank you, everyone. And I guess the moral of the story is the biggest bitch move is blame. So that's it. Have you ever failed in a project, career, or business? Whether you have or not, you can become a Fuck Up Nights organizer in your city, company, or university. Learn how at fuckupnights.com. Join the movement. Fuck up the system.